recognize maybe what we need is also a new mindset. Uh, it has been mentioned, uh, we in the business world, we see now that companies who are not committed to ESG metrics, to stakeholder capitalism, uh, just to stakeholder capitalism, that um, those companies are on the wrong side of history. But it's not only companies. I think we also have to ask the question how we can apply the ESG metrics even to governments to, uh, because uh, it's not just GDP. It's well-being, it's prosperity. My God, this guy can sing Twinkle Twinkle Little Star and it's going to be the most creepy, most ominous and most evil song that you have ever heard in your lifetime. No, seriously, Klaus, Klaus, my body. Herr Klaus, Herr Schwab, if you're listening to this, contact me. I want to give you a job. Like I'll, I'll write text and you do voice acting for it. Uh, we'll make money together. You know, we'll, we'll do it the stakeholder capitalism way. So what is ESG, you're wondering? Well, it's the diversity metrics. It's the making sure that your company is not polluting and it's dedicated to the Green New Deal. Uh, it's uh, making sure that your company has the right politics, that is very politically active and involved in the community. That, that's the ESG metrics, which is talking that governments should also uh, use them. Now, I don't want to focus on that. I want to focus on stakeholder capitalism because it implies there is a different type of capitalism. And that is true. That is shareholder capitalism, which was pushed heavily by what the World Economic Forum considers Satan incarnate, Milton Friedman. I, they, they really hate Milton Friedman. I mean, the, these people, if, if Milton Friedman would, would walk out of the grave and go to the World Economic Forum, Klaus Schwab would put garlic at the door in order to keep him away. So anyway, let's, let's look at shareholder capitalism, which is the worst capitalism ever. It's evil. It, it's purely satanic, according to the World Economic Forum. Now, in shareholder capitalism, you have the company, and its main purpose is to maximize profits. Sounds evil, doesn't it? Like making money. <laughs> what is wrong with companies with being greedy? Greedy cap is horrible, right? Okay, so let's look at the bare bones that constitutes a company. Like, let's simplify it as much as possible. Who are the actors? Well, you got the managerial class. Let's use an avatar as the CEO. You got the employees, which are producing the product. You got the customers which are buying the product in exchange for cash. You have the shareholders, and you also have the obsession of the World Economic Forum uh, society. It's a little bit cramped. It's the first time that I bring the board trying to explain something to people. I hope I'm doing a good job, and I hope I didn't misspell anything, because then I won't hear the end of it in the comment section. I think like everyone gets the gist of it, right? Like the shareholder and the board of directors, they name the CEO, and the managerial class is then underneath the CEO who leads the employees to produce goods for the customer. Now, what a lot of people don't mention, and you're never going to hear leftists even talk about this because they probably don't even understand how the system works, is that while these classes of people seem separate, most of the time they're not. What do I mean? I mean, well, the shareholders can be the employees. They can also be the customers. The employees can be customers themselves. So it's not really as black and white as you think. Now, the reason this is important is that by maximizing profits, everyone wins. Obviously, the shareholders win by getting more money. Like Their stocks are now worth more. Um, some companies pay dividends, so they directly earn more. But now a lot of people believe falsely by the way, that just because the company has more profits, the employees are going to get more money. Sometimes it's true, sometimes it's not. When a company has more profits, what ends up happening is that they reinvest in the business and then they try to create more jobs so they can expand. So this means more jobs. More jobs benefit society. More jobs doesn't necessarily mean that the employees are going to get a raise, by the way. But what it means is that the managerial positions now open up 
and that is a chance for the employees to climb the corporate ladder. But what it also means is that by expanding, there is now stability within the company, which means that most employees are probably going to enjoy this because if they didn't enjoy stability, they could just start their own business. Now, some companies that are smart, they realize that by paying the employees more, they're more likely to remain at the company because companies wouldn't want to exchange a 10-year-old employee that really knows how to do the job at the office for another employee that is just starting up. And if you pay employees more, it's not only that they're more likely to stay at the company, but they're probably more happy. They're going to work better. The customer wins because their commitment to the company is now being rewarded. They've been loyal customers for a long time. Now the company is becoming bigger. They're getting more of the same product. It's becoming more efficient. If you want to compare efficiency, come to Romania and see how efficient the corporations here are and then go to the United States and see the massive difference. When you have like a very efficient company, you can use the call center for customer support 24-7. Uh, they will immediately fix your problem versus a very small company that's only managed by one or two people. So the customer wins because of it. Now, the shareholders, by making a lot of money, they now have the ability to reinvest into society. They can donate to charity of their choice. Uh, and studies show that the more money people have, the more likely they are to donate to charity. And finally, the family of the shareholders benefit. They can now get more money. They can send their kids to college. They can afford a better lifestyle. And it encourages other people to try to become shareholders as well. So it encourages the customers to buy stocks. It encourages the employees to buy stocks. It encourages society to buy stocks so that they can too be shareholders and make money. Now, one of the main issues here is that a lot of people will go like, well, what about the environment? Like, what about you know, by maximizing profits, aren't we hurting the planet? Aren't we hurting society? And the answer is, well, not really. Um, think about uh, a company that does an oil spill. Which one do you think hurts most? Uh, the fine that the government gives them or the fact that the customers now really, really despise and hate this company? And because of that, they're not going to do business with this company anymore. Uh, think about a company that uh, openly discriminates against gay people. Even if it would be legal, you, you would have customers that will turn their backs away from that company. They wouldn't recognize it anymore. It would be really bad PR. Perfect example, Netflix. Netflix, by releasing the movie, the controversial movie Cooties, created uh, a lot of customers to shut down their account, move away from the company, and now the company lost billions of dollars. Now, I know that in the comment section, some of you are going to say, well, hold on, V, like this is just theory. It's not how the world works. You're, you're talking nonsense. And the reason you're thinking like that is because what I'm describing is shareholder capitalism. This is how Milton Friedman envisioned it. And it's how things used to be in the 60s. And there have been a lot of policy changes in the 70s and the new way of thought which moved away from shareholder capitalism into uh, progressing towards stakeholder capitalism. People of good will that those objectives should appeal to them. But you have to ask the question, does the system, no matter what its proponents say, produce those results? And once you look at the results, it's crystal clear that they do not. Where are social injustices greatest? Social injustices are clearly greatest where you have central control. The degree of social injustice and torture in a place like in, in incarceration, in a place like Russia, is of a different order of magnitude than it is in those Western countries where most of us have grown up and in which we have been accustomed to regarding freedom as our natural heritage. You look at the question of inequality, of equality. Where do you have the greatest degree of inequality? in the socialist states of the world. I remember about 15 years ago, my wife and I were in Russia for a couple of weeks. We were in Moscow. And we were, uh, we were going with our tourist uh, guide and happened to see, I happened to see some of the fancy Russian 
limousines up there, the Zivs. They were sort of a takeoff on the 1938 American Packard. <laughs> and I asked our tourist guide out of amusement, how much do those sell for? Oh, she said, those aren't for sale. Those are only for the members of the Politburo. You have in a country like Soviet Union enormous inequality in the immediate literal sense that there is a small select group that has all of the services and amenities of life and very large masses that are on a very, very low standard of living. Indeed, in a more direct way. If you take the wage rate of foremen versus the wage rate of ordinary workers in the Soviet Union, the ratio is much greater than it is in the United States. So that was Milton Friedman. And as you can see, he goes head to head with Klaus Schwab, who wrote the Davos Manifesto and is advocating for the stakeholder capitalism. So in the stakeholder capitalism, first of all, all stakeholders matter equally. So all the agents that I talked about before, the CEO, the shareholders, the employees, the customers, society is important. So now the job of a company isn't to produce goods and maximize profits. Now the job of a company is to act like an institution that promotes culture, that promotes well-being, that cares about the environment, that cares about the planet. And money is not the most important thing. Then society's goal is to increase the well-being of the people and the planet. So now it's not just the society itself, it's the planet as a whole. Globalism. It's, it's not just your country should care about its citizens. No, your government should care about the entire world now. Uh, this is foreign aid. This is massive immigration. This is being tolerant to other cultures that directly oppose your culture. So a democratic country, which functions by the, the rules of uh, liberalism and freedom, needs to be tolerant to a socialist country that oppresses its citizens and, and cracks down on the LGBT community. But that's their culture. It's exactly like Joe Biden <laughs> said that, well, you know, the Chinese, yes, they're oppressing the Uyghurs, but it's their culture. A democratic country needs to be tolerant towards a religious theocracy. It's their culture. You can't judge. You need to focus on long-term value creation and ESG measures. And, and this is what I talked about, the, the planet, the global warming, the uh, diversity, like hiring more diverse people in positions of power. Um, and, and let's look at how it would represent on the board. Now, as I mentioned before, in shareholder capitalism, the main component is the free market. However, in stakeholder capitalism, as we saw Klaus Schwab say, that the governments themselves need to adhere to stakeholder capitalism, which now means that society, also known as the government, has to intervene directly into the life of the company. And thus, you don't have a free market anymore. You don't necessarily have a, a regulative system either. But it would be more similar to China. In other words, companies are free to do whatever they want unless the government intervenes. And the government should be able to intervene whatever it decides to. Now, the focus isn't on the profit. So if the focus isn't on the profit, all the things that we talked about before are going to be on reverse. It means that if you're not focused on the profit, you don't really need to have a high productivity anymore. The employees don't, don't have to be as productive. You don't really need to reduce the price of the goods anymore. So now you have fewer goods, they become more expensive, job stability becomes lower because at any point the government can say, we're shutting down your business because you're polluting too much. We're shutting down your business because it's not essential and we're in the middle of a pandemic. So we're going to allow Amazon to produce. Why? Because fuck you, that's why we're keeping people safe from their paycheck. The shareholders, they get less money because the profits don't matter, meaning less people are incentivized to become shareholders, less people have the money to open new businesses, less people want to become entrepreneurs. So you now have fewer companies, but larger companies. So, so you now have like the Amazon, but all the mom and pop shops, they go away. You now have like the bigger corporations that the government favors 
because the government has an easier time controlling the economy if it has less actors to deal with. But anyway, enough chit-chat, let's go to the meat of it. So how does it actually work? Well, now it's top-down, it's hierarchical. You got the World Economic Forum, Klaus Schwab. You got a center of elite people that represent the interests of big corporations. So under Klaus Schwab, you can have, let's say, Jeff Bezos. Perfect example because he runs Amazon and recently he actually got $9 billion from the U.S. government as a bailout. In other words, this is how it works. The government is going to pay certain anointed people money in order to raise the share price of that company. So the government now gets to decide which companies get to succeed and which companies get to fail. And the way they do it is by printing money, by having quantitative easing, by, by giving stimmy checks, uh, by giving tax exemptions, um, by having various regulations that benefit some companies and not others. So, for example, pandemic, your company gets to stay, your company gets to shut down. Eh? Now the government is an active actor. Now the government is making sure that it's not a free market economy, but the government gets to favor certain companies, and more specifically, they get to favor certain people, certain individuals. Now, since the money is coming from the government, that means that you don't really need the shareholders as much. So the CEO, which controls most of the money that comes from the government, gets to redistribute it however he wants. And one way that he's going to be heavily incentivized to distribute it is to give it to the politicians. Whether he can do this through lobbying, whether he can do this by buying a famous politician's book from Amazon and millions of copies, there are many ways that this can be achieved. And in exchange for this, he's going to expect favors. He might want his friends to get cushy government positions. He might want the government to shut down his competition by calling them non-essential businesses. He might want to keep people locked up indoors so they can watch Netflix. He might expect some tax deductibles. And this is why the shareholders are going to keep the CEO around. Because while the, the shareholders are getting less money, the CEO, by his personality, by, by advocating for the greater good in society, manages to get money from the government. Manages to get the funny money, the, the money that's being printed manages to get them into the corporation. Without the CEO, if someone else comes in charge, the favors don't remain. So now the competition isn't going to be suppressed. So the shareholders, yes, they're not getting money, but they have an interest in maintaining the same guy into power because the guy brings favors. Now, another way that the CEOs are going to donate money is to influencers, certain People in society that have created a cult of personality, that have massive subscribers on social media, that have um, connections with the press or even the press themselves. And these influencers are going to brainwash the people, they're, they're going to, to puppeteer the people into thinking about the greater good. So, for example, they're going to get people to think that um, I don't know, climate change is the most pressing issues of our day. And because of that, this company is fighting against climate change and this politician is fighting against climate change. So, so all the things that are happening in society, like higher gas prices, uh, more taxation, uh, all of this is done for the greater good. So you should support this because it's good for you. And these influencers... They're also going to make sure that anyone that dissents, any other influencer that, that props up and they're advocating for shareholder capitalism again or, or for more freedom, more liberty, more civil rights, these people will get suppressed. They will get suppressed by the politicians, they'll get suppressed by the influencers, and they'll get suppressed by the companies themselves. Like the corporations can uh, deplatform them, remove their books, uh, get the banks to shut their accounts, and, and all of this is stakeholder capitalism. 
Okay? And if you look at other things that they're advocating for is higher taxation. Right? So higher taxation means that now the politician is getting more money. The government is taking more money from you. So it's more power to the government because now you're reliant on the government to help you out. You're not going to vote a party that talks about individualism, that talks about uh, self-sustainance. No, because you need money from the government to keep existing. And the government constantly printing money is also an indirect tax on the middle class, which loses its purchasing power, which yet again benefits the Klaus Schwab anointed CEO because now people don't have the money to start their own business. It's less likely for people to start a new business because at the same time, while you pay a lot of taxes, the government also heavily regulates the economy to make it next to impossible to start a new business. So to come back, the shareholder capitalism gives the power to the shareholder and any person can become a shareholder. And as the shareholders are making money, then they donate that money to various activities in societies that they consider to be essential. Maybe some people do donate for climate change, but other people may donate for education or for orphanages or for the homeless. Like the money goes towards everyone. It dissipates. In stakeholder capitalism, usually they will have a, a main reason to donate, whether that is like fighting uh, against hate or, or fighting against racism or uh, the climate change. It's usually like certain activities that are going to have all the money funneled towards. And because of that, you're not going to have people caring about the homeless anymore. You're not going to have people caring about the orphans or other topics that do not appear in the mainstream media. And right? the, the, the important thing is to donate to an NGO that fights against racism. And then that money gets diluted towards the influencers and towards the politicians without the actual people on the ground benefiting at all. So shareholder capitalism is to empower the individual. Stakeholder capitalism is to create a very organized society in which you have the elites that are controlling the way the money goes. And then you have the people that are supposed to have less, to, to eat less, to um, earn less, to, to benefit from less in order to fight against global warming while the elites still get to maintain the same lifestyle that they had previously. However, as you probably already figured out, stakeholder capitalism is just a rebranding of an existing theory that has been throughout human history for quite a while. It's economic fascism. Fascists commonly sought to eliminate the autonomy of large-scale capitalism and relegate it to the state. Fascism does support private property rights, so you're still allowed to have your little boutique. If you're one of the very lucky ones that by some miracle of chance managed to open your own business, you get to keep it until the next lockdown comes. But at the same time, fascism supports the rights and the existence of a market economy and very wealthy individuals. So huge wealth disparity. Look at California. Look at what's happening there. Massive numbers of homelessness because crime rates are now encouraged. Crime rates means that the little guy can't start his own business. Good luck starting your kiosk on a street that is filled with gangbangers. Good, good luck opening a restaurant when, when you have people uh, pushing a needle in their arm right next to it and leaving their garbage there. So crime is encouraged in order to keep the little guy from opening his business. And, and this is like what stakeholder capitalism really does, really is. And you're not going to see anyone in the press criticizing or bringing these issues up to discussion. Because at the end of the day, Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I just fail to understand the great wisdom of Klaus Schwab. And maybe it's just coincidental that he viewed COVID as a great opportunity. Maybe he just doesn't realize that states like Texas are becoming more and more green without the need of government intervention, without the need of stakeholder capitalism. But... I don't see these criticisms being raised. I, I don't see anyone bringing them about. Isn't that fascinating? It's me with a little YouTube channel 
uh, barely any understanding of economics, just looking at his theory and going, hold on a little bit, let's see what Milton Friedman had to say. And when you look at what Milton Friedman had to say, a lot of it suddenly makes sense. Now, if you managed to stay up till this point, I want to thank you all for listening. And if you really like the channel, please give it a thumbs up. It really helps or subscribe. I mean, you can do these things for free and it really uses the algorithm to push this video forward. And if you really enjoy my work, then you can contribute. There's a link into the pinned comment section to my subscribe. Even small donations help. And then I can feel like uh, Bezos getting funny money from the government. Let me know what you guys think, and I'll see you in the comment section. Take care.